people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Light is that time of year when lights are everywhere. On famous landmarks, across our streets, outside our homes, inside our homes. You can't stop for seeing new lights everywhere at this season. In our house, Christmas only really feels like it's beginning when the Christmas tree has made it inside the house. The kids love to decorate it, although the lights, it has to be said, they're left to the professionals, their mother. The kind of conversation that might go in our house is one of our sons would come up to us and say, Daddy, Daddy, do you mind if I help with the Christmas tree this year? Absolutely, son, let's get involved. Well, first, we need to get the tree. Secondly, we need to drag it inside the house, causing as little damage as possible. Thirdly, we need to place it in our living room. Fourthly, we need to decorate it. Fifthly, we need to show your mother. Sixthly, your mother tells us what we did wrong. <laughs> It's a strange tradition, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever thought about it. And no time, and no other time of year, is it considered appropriate behaviour to take essentially what is a part of the garden and drag it inside, put it front in, in the middle of the living room, decorate it, put lights on it, and then watch it slowly die whilst listening to Michael Bublé. <laughs> it's never appropriate behaviour any time of year, but Christmas does something funny to us, doesn't it? Christmas dead trees and all gives us a chance to look back. I wonder as you look back on this year, what you'll remember. In our house we try and encourage our children to look back on the days that they've had. Around the dinner table we'll, we'll ask them how their day has been and sometimes to give it a bit of variety we will ask them a bit of a different question. So we asked them recently, what's the funniest thing that happened to you at school this day? Well, recently our seven-year-old went first. He said, Daddy, we were playing dodgeball in the playground. Someone lost the ball. So we went to get another ball and someone kicked that into the nursery playground. So we had to go and get another ball. Someone kicked that into the nursery playground. And I was like, why does everyone keep kicking the ball into the nursery playground? Daddy, that was the funniest thing that happened to me today. <laughs> so in due course, we then had to go around each of the other children. So we went to the 11-year-old and the 11-year-old who just recently started a new school said she was lost with her friend in one of the corridors and caught her eyes upon uh, uh, some more seasoned uh, pupils at the school and they asked for directions. And so they went for directions and they followed those directions up a corridor, down a corridor, up some stairs, down some stairs and when, by the time they got round they saw the same girls again. So they said, which way is it to our English classroom? They said, you need to go this way. So they followed the directions and they went up some stairs, down some stairs, along a corridor, and they came across the same girls again. So then I, they said to me, well, where is our English classroom? We're going to be late now. And so they said, we, well, it's just in this way. And so they followed the directions, and by the time they got there, they eventually got to the classroom. Daddy, that was the funniest thing that happened to me today at school. So it came upon our five-year-old, who'd been silent the entire time, as if waiting for his moment to shine. My wife asked him, and what about you? What was your funniest moment at school? He said, you know what? He said, I went into the toilet and two boys were playing with a poo. <laughs> you know, we all like those times to remember some, for one reason or another, we remember more than others. And by many of us will have had those enjoyable, memorable times this year that have lit up our year. It is also hard also though not to also wonder about the darker times. It seems in our world there's increasing mistrust, division and fear across our world from the global to the local, from the political to the institutional, between nations and people and parties, genders and ethnicities. And of course, this year we experienced firsthand terrorism attacks in our own country. And of course, as we all remember, uh, watching the tragedy unfold just only a few miles away at the Grenville Towers, the fire engulfed that tower. And it remains a shell, almost a monument to the division and darkness of our times. One of the many responses to that fire was a, a poem that actually one of the local community wrote, he said this, forced to watch lights at the windows, torches of those who were still alive, 
for the time being, signalling desperate, faint hope until floor by floor the darkness snuffed them out. And for some of us, darkness can feel even more close, even more tangible, more personal. Maybe that darkness that creeps in with a deep sense of loneliness that never seems to go away. Maybe for us, the fear of what a new year is about to bring. Maybe the confusion in what lies ahead. For others, maybe the darkness of sorrow as we reflect in lo losing someone close to us this year. On those living in the land of deep darkness, Isaiah says, a light has dawned. What if it could be possible for light to break through this year into your circumstances? A light dawns in the darkness of confusion, that moment of clarity. In the darkness of pain, that moment of peace. In the darkness of loneliness, that moment of love, a light dawns. In the darkness of despair, that moment to dream. In the darkness of fear, that moment of faith. In the darkness of sorrow, that moment of solace, a light dawns. And what if it were more than just a moment? That the light would last and the darkness would not overcome it. One moment can change the trajectory of our entire lives. There was a moment for our four-year-old last Christmas. He was so excited in the weeks leading up, asking us how long it was until Christmas, how many weeks, how many days, and then how many hours, and he was so excited. He knew what was coming, and he was old enough to understand it, and, and he was so excited for Christmas Day. And when Christmas Day arrived, you could tell he was a bit disappointed. So we asked him, well, why are you disappointed? He said, it's meant to snow on Christmas Day. So we had to explain to him it doesn't always snow in England and it's only if you're really lucky that it snows on Christmas Day itself. And he says, so, so where does it snow on Christmas Day so I can move there? <laughs> and we said, well, as, as, as uh, his mum, my wife is from America, we said, well, in America it snows. He said, America? Oh, no. <laughs> Donald Trump lives there. <laughs> All he wanted was snow. That moment changed his view of Christmas. And I recognise there are some of you here tonight who've been dragged here by friends with the promise of mulled wine. Yep. Yeah. And my mince pies. And maybe a pint afterwards too. And maybe for you, at best, this Christmas story just gives us an excuse to cheer us all up in this rather cold time of year. Sing a few songs, open a few presents. It's a nice bit of tradition, isn't it? And I know some of you will be rightly thinking it will all be worth it when the bloke at the front sits down. And I have every sympathy. But what if, what if there was something in it. You see, no person has impacted the world as that baby born 2,000 years ago. How did the life of a man who travelled no further than 100 miles, who held no position of influence, cause us to gather here, 5,000 miles away from when that happened and 2,000 years away from when it happened? This world began with a flash of light and with it that light created life. God declared let there be light and there was light and with it life. Light gives life, darkness does not. And we have in our mind that if God were to exist he's distant at best. But the message of Christmas is that the light that we hope for, that we long for, was prophesied 
those thousands of years ago by the prophet Isaiah. And that light was not an abstract force or a trick of the mind or wishful thinking, but a knowable person. A person like you and me, the person of Jesus Christ. And he was given a name, a nickname if you like, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. That God is not absent or distant, but present. Questions over his existence don't really hold any weight. The question is, why? You know, no matter how many answers we may or may not have to the questions that we all hold in life, we're always left with that fundamental question, why? We are able to know God because he chose to become known. God himself stepped into our darkness, born not into splendor but squalor. This boy grew to be a man and lived a life much like us, experienced the kind of things that you and me experience. Experiencing the darkness too, the darkness of grief, of loneliness, of injustice, and even death itself. Not just any death, but the most, one of the most cruel ever known to humankind at the age of 33. He chose that. And not because he would gain anything, but because we would gain everything. He died a criminal's death. The few followers he had fled in fear for their own lives. There was literally nothing left of this little group. But something changed. Something changed that meant thousands of years later we would be gathered here. Two days after the events of his death, Jesus defeated death and rose again. And history changed in that moment. He was born to die. He died so that we could live. And in the months before his death, he told his friends, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He went into darkness so that we could find the light. That first Christmas, a boy was born as a gift to the whole of humanity, each one of us. And what is on offer this Christmas is an opportunity to grasp life. Now, as far-fetched as it might sound, from the beginning of time, he had you in mind. God, the creator of all that is seen and unseen, is mindful of you. Stop a moment. Don't let this moment pass you by. He is mindful of you. God is seeking after us, chases after us, is interested in us, in you. And why? Well, there's that question again. Because his love for you stretches further than any of us will ever know. And when many of us spend our lives trying to earn approval, we can know there's nothing we can do to make him love us more, and there's nothing we can do to make him love us less. It is on offer to anyone who chooses. It is unconditional love. And that is what some call grace. Grace. It's the kind of grace that the grime artist Stormzy sung about earlier this year. And you'll be pleased to know, I'm not going to sing it or rap it for you. Oh, go on. <laughs> but he said this, Lord, I've been broken. And although I'm not worthy, you fixed me. And now I'm blinded by your grace. You came and saved me. Grace will never really understand because it screams in the face of a so-called perfect Instagrammed world where we're told all the time, prove it, earn it, show me you're worth it. 
but grace instead lifts up the broken. It gives hope to the despairing. It offers life to each one of us. It is light. And as the Gospel writer in the Gospel of John, as we read at the beginning, says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. It is Jesus who is the source of light for our lives that will last. If you've been invited here by friends tonight, maybe members of this church community, they've invited you to know that it is Jesus that gives them life. Jesus was given as a light to our world in our darkness. It is him who gives us clarity in our confusion, peace in our pain and solace in our sorrow. He compels us, he draws us, enables us to see things for what they really are. He shows us the way, he gives us a hope and a purpose. No wonder the angels declared that it was good news of great joy. This evening is an opportunity to grab hold of the new life that is offered to you this Christmas. It is a gift. And a gift only means something <coughs> as we begin to unwrap it. And so my invitation to each one of us this evening is that we take that step to begin to unwrap that gift, that new life. Now as I close, there may be someone here who this evening, anything of what's been said or sung has struck a chord who wants to take that step to unwrap that gift. And if there is, I want to encourage you that as I pray, you echo those words in your own heart, not out loud, because I want to create a moment for anybody who wants to respond. May we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the offer of the gift of life this Christmas. Thank you that you died so that I may live. I am sorry when I have lived my own way. Thank you that in you I am forgiven. This evening I accept that gift of life. Please come into my life to be with me forever.